foreign investment and how this is related to uh, economic development. As usual, we'll start with the uh, feedback from uh, the previous lecture. You rated the lecture 4.8 out of 5 on average. You put some nice comments about the lecture, but the nicest comment I had was congratulations for my baby girls. Thank you. Um, as a quick recap to what we covered last lecture, uh, we discussed how economic, how uh, foreign aid um, affect economic development, but we started with uh, the measurement problems that we usually encounter or we should keep in mind when, uh, when we discuss the effect of uh, foreign aid uh, on development. Uh, first, we talked about uh, we have different types of foreign aid grants and loans. Grants doesn't require uh, repayment, but loans does uh, do require uh, repay to be re repaid. So these are two different types of, of, of payment or of, of flow. Sorry, uh, tied aid. Some some development aid uh, could be tied to. Um, um, maybe to a specific project or to uh, uh, import uh, products from the donor uh, country, uh, etc. Uh, also, we highlighted the fact that or the importance of looking at real value rather than the nominal value of, of foreign aid. Then we focused the discussion only on ODA or official development assistance. Uh, and we saw that in, in general, in terms of the absolute value, it seems to be increasing over time. However, when we look at this as a percentage of the gross national income of donor countries, we see actually it is, it is in fact declining. So it is going down. Um, and we show that um, we are way below the UN target of 0.7% of GNI of donor countries. So most countries are below this uh, threshold, 0.7% of GNI. As an example, the USA is the largest uh, country donor in, in absolute terms. But if we look at how much is that to compare to its GNI, it's about 0.18%. We also highlighted the fact that well, developed countries, yes, they, they pay um, foreign aid uh, for many reasons. We, we're going to talk about this now. We already talked about this last, uh, last lecture. However, at the same time, they um, spend much, much more on agriculture uh, or farm subsidies, which really harm agriculture sector in developing uh, countries. And also they spend much, much more on, on defense compared to how much they spend on uh, development aid. Then we move to talk about the motives, why foreign countries, why foreign, uh, why donors give aid. Um, there are different reasons why donors give aid, but it's very, impor very important to understand that donors, it's very difficult to think that donors just give money away just to support or to help or for only uh, humanitarian reasons or moral reasons, there must be some, there must be something in return as well. So some, some donors might have some political agendas or some, uh, they expect some support in return, whatever, we explained this last time. There could be economic reasons for why uh, donors give money as well, development uh, uh, aid. But then when we turn to look at theory and empirical evidence, we discussed several papers that we focus mainly on about four or five uh, theoretical uh, papers and two or three, I think two, empirical uh, papers. And these seem to confirm our intuition behind why donors, donor country give aid, okay? So some of these highlighted the idea of political agendas or uh, expectation in terms of supporting the donor country political agenda. Also, some of these uh, link foreign aid to trade, so economic reason here for the benefit of the donor country. 
Um, others talk about ethnic lobbying, which we discussed this as well, or containing illegal immigration, or uh, uh, alleviating uh, terrorism uh, threat by supporting counterterrorism efforts in, in the, uh, in the um, recipient country. So there are so many um, motives you can find in, the, in, the, in theory and in, in empirical uh, work. We discussed a few of these, about seven papers last time. But on the other side, we talked about, so if these are the reasons why donors give aid, so what are the reasons for recipients to accept uh, aid? Uh, the very um, basic or the simplest answer to this question should be economic motives, and we use the dual gap analysis. We explain that they lack resources, they need to cover this, or they need to fill this uh, saving gap or, or foreign exchange gap, and um, foreign aid can help to do this. But also, we say, well, there could be other reasons, not uh, purely economic mo motives, uh, why, uh, why recipient countries accept aid. And one of which could be because they want to use this money. Um, corrupt leaders, dictators, they usually would think about this money as an opportunity or resources that they can use to suppress opposition and maintain power, remain in power. Okay. So there are different reasons why it happened. So these are the motives that we discussed in the previous lecture. Then we move to talk about the effects of, of uh, development aid. And we, th we, we saw how this is uh, a debatable uh, 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 discussion. It's like very, very um, uh, broad discussion. and So much to say about this. But we try to summarize the main arguments here. Uh, we have two sides of the argument. One side think there's no effect of foreign aid on, uh, on growth. And actually, it undermined development. On the other side, no, it is important. Foreign aid is important, and it promotes structural tra transformation. So on one side, the team that think or argue that aid isn't working, they usually uh, provide some argument. We mentioned some of them. We talked about how aid could be used to support uh, corrupt govern governments, uh, and also it encourage responsible financial policies. And one of the very, pro uh, very popular examples in this is how much, how, mu uh, how much was spent on Africa for more than 50 years, but Africa is still extremely poor. So this is one of the examples that usually uh, those who are against development aid or the, the role of development aid in development or in promoting development, they bring into the discussion how um, billions of dollars were spent on Africa, but Africa remained poor till today. So it doesn't seem to be working. Of course, we discussed the counter arguments. We, we said how uh, uh, when we look at the amount received per head, amount of foreign aid, how this is very low, so we should not have too much expectation as to how much this should actually achieve. Um, also, there we say there's no dispute or disagreement about the benefits of humanitarian aid. This is something that we can't, we can't really uh, disagree on. And also, the one uh, counter-argument says that we could use foreign aid as a leverage or can give us as donor countries leverage to promote good governance and good uh, economic policies. In so it gives you some way to put some pressure on those countries to um, uh, adopt uh, uh, or promote good, good governance. We highlighted the one very valid criticism to foreign aid, which is very important, is the, uh, the, uh, the foreign aid may actually uh, promote a culture of dependency and we focus on the tax reforms and uh, uh, collect our tax revenues in, in, uh, in poor countries. We showed some, some graphs last time and we explain how there's some sort of relation between how much uh, a country receives aid and how much they raise from taxes. And we show a map of Africa and we show how much, in, in some cases, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of aid they receive is actually, ex it, it actually exceeds the revenues they collect, the tax revenues they collect. 
So there was like some suggestion that donor countries could actually uh, put some upper limit uh, 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 of uh, aid to tax ratio. So uh, to encourage developing countries to uh, collect more uh, more tax to, to be to depend on their on their uh, own resources first and then complement this with uh, or supplement this with 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 uh, foreign aid so foreign aid shouldn't be the main the main source of of, uh, of income or uh, financial flows that support uh, development plans and then we briefly talked about the macroeconomic impacts at the end we said well first we said it can work actually but it depends on many uh, many factors one was uh, the uh, uh, absorptive capacity of the recipient economy so there could be yes so much money going to africa but they don't have the capacity to utilize this in an efficient way they don't have the administrative capacity or they don't have uh, uh, um, those who can actually uh, use these in an uh, uh, these resources in an efficient way uh, also could be um, again if you uh, if there's um, aid itself or foreign aid itself is not enough because it it requires to um, or, or there, there must be good governance good macroeconomic policies so it's it's more about the the the, the, the environment in which uh, aid is uh, is is being uh, is being utilized so Again, this is something missing in, or this is something problematic in foreign, in developing uh, economies. We talked about macroeconomic impacts, and we said if exchange, if foreign exchange sold to central bank, uh, not spend directly on imports, there there's danger of Dutch disease, which means the, ex the exchange rate appreciation, and this will make exports more relatively more expensive. Aid and growth. We we discussed only one paper uh, last time when we talk about aid and growth. And that's pretty much everything we talked about. Uh, now it's time to go. Please, uh, please go on Socrative and uh, enter your email address and uh, tell me how can foreign aid, of course, from um, like tell me your thought about this. How can foreign aid promote economic development? What are the conditions uh, that are or under which foreign aid can be supportive can be pro development okay um, aid or foreign aid flowing for different reasons different motives toward developing countries but in most cases doesn't really um, didn't really really deliver what was hoped from these resources of course there's progress you can't ignore it 100% or we can totally say there's no effect at all but what we would like to see is much more wha than what uh, has been achieved so the question here how can we make it work how can foreign aid promote economic development you already know this we uh, this is the last lecture in topic uh, in, in uh, block E uh, if the I flows and uh, economic development as usual we'll we'll show some uh, statistics we look at the trend and the distribution of uh, foreign uh, direct investment and then we will ask the same question what are the motives why foreign investors or why in investors go abroad and go in and invest abroad and um, and then we'll, we'll discuss the effect of uh, FDI so we already discussed this last lecture when we talk about aid. We, we said how foreign financial inflows are important for development, again, because of the lack of resources, the shortage in uh, um, developing countries. And we highlighted the um, issue of the uh, current account deficit that coming from the um, having uh, the export not uh, covering or the exchange foreign exchange that received um, from export or export is not uh, as the same as or less than than imports so they need to supplement this they need to fill this gaps by using foreign resources or foreign financial uh, inflows we we said out different types of uh, 
foreign financial resources. We already discussed now um, uh, foreign aid. We'll discuss today private uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, we're probably not going to talk about remittances, but remittances is important too. So foreign direct investment or capital flows and uh, uh, multinational corporations, um, the growth or the extraordinary growth that we've seen in international trade and capital flows, this was associated with the rise of multinational corporation, meaning that a corporation or enterprise that conduct and control uh, 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 proactive activities in more than one country. So they work across countries. And this was usually huge firms that are based on mainly North America, Europe, uh, and Japan, and maybe other uh, high-income countries. But recently, those companies uh, do exist in fast-growing, developing countries such as Brazil and China. So we will focus only on foreign direct investment. And that means uh, foreign investors go to another country or a foreign country and establish business uh, 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 and acquire uh, uh, assets. And that include the ownership. So they should have control uh, on that uh, or, or ownership on that, on that investment. The OECD um, usually said, I will put like a threshold of 10%. So, so the minimum is 10% to be defined as a foreign direct investment, to own 10% of that investment or that uh, project. So this is different from portfolio investment. And as I said, we'll focus, only, we'll focus, focus mainly on foreign direct investment. So as usual, we, I like to see the trend. I like to see how this has been going over the uh, last few decades. Um, this graph from the World Bank database shows the uh, FDI inflows in billions of US dollars since 1989 um, till 20, I think 2016. And you can see this like upward trend, so it's increasing, okay? Uh, obviously, um, well, over the 1990s, uh, and then again, there's like another phase during 2000 up to the financial crisis 2007, 2008. So there was a sharp drop, and then uh, seems to sort of not fully recover, but it still is kind of going back to, um, again, it's not the same level, but it seems like showing some sort of recovery. But there are questions about this here in 2015, 2017, as we will see now. So but it's not fully, that's what I'm saying. It's not fully recovered since uh, the financial crisis. So this graph, uh, kind of zooming in the trend, the FDI trend. We, we talk about FDI inflows. Okay. So this graph show you um, these trends. Uh, the gray one, the gray line is the wallet total, which is exactly similar to this one, but just we're zooming in from uh, 2005 till 2017. And by the way, this is from the uh, World Investment Report 2018. So I d uh, there's a link here so you can uh, read the report if you are interested. Um, the uh, also, we have this line for developing economies, uh, developed economies, the red one, uh, the, the green one, um, developing economies, and then kind of orange color, and then the, um, the other color here is the transition economies. So what's interesting here is like if you look at what happened in 2017, uh, this circle here summarizes exactly what happened in 2017. So in, in total, so if we talk about the wallet uh, FDI inflows, so there's comparing 2017 with 2016, there's a drop 23%. Okay, so this drop in the wallet FDI. If you look at the uh, where this come from, so the developed economies, the green circle this part is it dro it has dropped by 37 percent so we're comparing between 2016 so the year before and 2017. in 
developing countries seems to not be uh, the, the growth is 0%, so it has changed uh, from 2016 to 2017, but actually the year before it dropped 10%, okay? So this is like a kind of zoom in about what happened to FDI flows in 2017. So this summarizes exactly what I said now. So global flows of FDI fell by 23% tw in 2017, and this come mainly... This drop mainly happened in developed and transition economies. Uh, developing economies, FDI flows, uh, inflows uh, remain stable at $671 billion. Um, but however, this doesn't show any recovery or uh, it didn't recover from uh, the 10% drop that happened in 2016, so the year, uh, the year before. Uh, yet, there's a modest recovery projected in uh, 2018 so the kind of sort of negative trend if you look at this trend here uh, this is this is 2015 so if you look at here this is from 2016 to 2017 it seems like like kind of negative or going down negative trend and this is the uh, a long-term concern uh, to policymakers in general and of course in developing countries in in particular and this slide I'm trying to explain why we see this sort of uh, declining trend of FDI. Obviously, you have opportunities, you have uh, a, a good uh, macroeconomic outlook relatively compared to the, the uh, few years back, but in the same time, you have uh, risks. So, on those risks, geopolitical risk, trade wars, uh, trade tensions, uh, concerns about shifting toward more protectionist policies, etc. So, so, the global economy offer opportunities, of course, which is something positive for FDI or foreign investors, but at the same time, we, we have some, uh, some risks that might slow down uh, FDI, uh, FDI flows. That. So that might explain why you see this uh, negative trend here. So also, some changes in uh, developing developed countries might explain this sort of uh, uh, negative trend, especially the U.S. tax reform, which is likely to affect investment decision by U.S. investors, and this obviously will have some implication to the global investment patterns. Also, uh, other changes like interest rate rises in developed uh, economies, and this will have some implication to developing countries and emerging uh, markets. So, this is the, these are the um, flows to developing countries. So we saw, we saw this, uh, a similar graph, it's not the same, but exactly uh, it show very similar to this. It shows the different types of uh, financial flows to developing countries. The reason I'm showing you this is just to show you the importance of FDI inflows. So if you compare how much, where this line is, it's obviously above all the other uh, sources compared to official development assistance or ODA this is like nearly at the bottom here and then even remittances even remittances, remittances even more important in terms of um, how much it offers or how much uh, uh, resources uh, or flows happen so it's, it's much higher but if you compare this with FDI of the I comes so it's one of the lar largest uh, sources of uh, foreign financial uh, uh, resources. Okay, so that gives you some indication of the importance of FDI. Just looking at how much uh, or different sources of fi uh, foreign financial resources, you will see that FDI probably one or the largest or the most important one. Um, this show you the composition of this. So it's try to uh, just give you like how much it is to developing economies, uh, about 39% of flows to uh, capital flows to uh, developing countries. So about 40% nearly here, FDI, okay? And then the rest, remittances is 24%, and this one, uh, 11%, the uh, uh, ODA. So in least develop, uh, developing countries, which is the poorer countries or smaller countries, uh, still, if the eye is important, it's 21%, maybe uh, uh, um, 
I think this, this is remittances. Yeah, remittances is probably a bit more important, but in general for most developing countries, FDI is more, uh, more important. So it's interesting to see this. So just to summarize what we saw that both graphs. So FDI is the largest source of external finance for developing economies. And also, by the way, FDI is more resilient, relatively more resilient to economic and financial shocks compared to other sources. Okay, because when you when an investor uh, moves to a foreign country, they invest in assets, they build factories, or they, 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 they take equipment, they take experts. So it's, l it's a large investment. Okay, so it's not really easy to um, to make a decision to relocate or to leave, um, and it, it might come with uh, uh, significant uh, losses. So it, it shows some resilience to economic and financial shocks. So it doesn't fly out. It doesn't doesn't leave. Uh, quickly, but still will we'll, we'll show some responses to other to some factors as we see at the end when we look at the empirical evidence. But in general, yes, it's its largest source. We're talking about facts here. We're talking about uh, numbers, so it shows that it's the largest source of uh, of, of uh, external finance for developing economies. It's probably the most resilient, and uh, it accounts for 39 percent. We already said that. That's on average between 2013 to 2017, and it exhibits lower uh, volatility compared to other sources. Okay, so you would like, as a policymaker in a developing country, you would prefer actually this sort of um, uh, source of, of finance that is less volatile. That's something that doesn't go up and down w w in unexpected way. So you want to make plans so you need to know how much uh, uh, coming in so anyway uh, this show you the same but looking at different uh, regions so what is your what is the came the, the, the key message here on this graph what does this tell us how much if the eye going to poor countries sub-saharan Africa where Africa for example where is sub-saharan Africa this is the share of sub-saharan Africa compared to other countries, to other regions, okay? So the share of MENA, uh, Middle East and North Africa, just can hardly see it, okay? So that tells you something about, again, development, okay? So how much those countries, Sub-Saharan Africa or those poorest countries, how much they can attract, how much FDI they can attract, they're still struggling even with this, okay? So it tells you, so most of this investment, you see the, the bar here for Europe, this is the, the tallest one, and then you compare this with East Asia, well, East Asia doing relatively much uh, better, um, and, and Latin America, they, they, they are much better compared to Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, Middle East and North Africa. And, and that's why I thought it's really interesting to look at Africa. So what is happening here in terms of FDI? So you, you, you might be surprised to see that in 2017, the share of Africa, uh, of the FDI, if is 2.9%. Like very, very tiny uh, share, very, very small share compared to the uh, FDI. Uh, so this graph shows you the uh, five, the, 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 the flows to... Um, the big five uh, host economies, these are the circled ones. So one, two, three, four, five. So we're looking at Egypt, Ethiopia, Nigeria, uh, Ghana, and Morocco. And the color scheme, so the, um, the green one show you the above, I think it's about three billion. Oh, I think it's billion. Um, billion, not trillion, sorry. Uh, and then the this, this color, that means it's, it's below... Um, 0.5 billion, the gray one, the gray color. So the green one, it's above three billion dollars. The gray one is uh, below uh, 0.5 billion. So again, it just just give you an idea. But it, that in total, Africa in total together, they have this modest uh, share of uh, FDI. So this exactly, this says exactly what I'm saying, uh, what I said, and also show you how. Um, how much it dropped actually um, uh, 
uh, in, in 2017. But if you compare Africa's share in FDI compared to developed economies, 49.8%. Four if you compare this, well, it is actually, actually we should compare it with other developing countries. So if you, if you look at developing Asia, the share is 33%, so compared to 2.9 in Africa and 10% in, in Latin America, even though the flows to Africa dropped by 21% uh, last year. So, and that continue, this de decline is continuing from 2015. There are many reasons that can explain this because these countries uh, usually, um, they are not diversified economies, so most of them, they use, they are commodity exporting economies, and there was a large, a significant drop in oil prices in um, 2014 and continue till 2016 and most of this investment usually go there for extraction so they actually uh, work in this sector in the uh, oil sector or, or whatever this commodity is but in general it's, it could be oil so the drop happened in in egypt mozambique congo nigeria angola more diversified exporters probably will be more resilient to um to these changes so anyway so let's just now, just move on to the determinants of FDI. But before we, we just move on, let me summarize the, the main idea from all these trends and, and, and flows. So what we saw here is, well, FDI seemed to be one of the, or the largest, not just one of, it's the largest source of financial, uh, of, of capital flows, okay? Um, so it is important. There's so much money going on moving around okay however when you look at africa a very poor continent so the share of africa is very 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 modest very very small it's very tiny 2.9 percent is nothing that we're talking about 20 um 2017 even when we look at over time this i like this that's why i like this graph it just tell you how much sub-saharan africa or, uh, or or north africa has or receive uh, or attract from FDI compared to other developing countries and developed countries as well. So this is the, the, the key message we, we give, so we try to, to explain, give some reasons why we see this trend and also, um, but it's difficult, uh, I think it's probably the, 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 the most important reason is it, it has to do with conflicts and uh, geopolitical risk, and this is something we'll we'll talk about at the end when we talk about um, uh, empirical evidence. I've done some research on this, and I'm just going to show you the uh, what we found out uh, uh, in in the end of this of this lecture. Again, trying to link FDI to um, tensions and conflict and political risk, and that might explain to you or partly tell you why Africa doesn't have uh, or is not very attractive uh, place uh, for um, FDI. Anyway, so that's the key message from for so far from this lecture. So next, okay, if we understand that FDI seems to be, well, is, is, is a very, uh, it's a large resource. So um, although some, I the distribution seem to be, um, some countries are not really successful at attracting enough FDI. Uh, others might be more successful, comp relatively more successful. But whatever the reason or whatever um, the case is, we should ask ourselves the question, why? So what are the motives? Why, why foreign investors would take their money and go abroad? Okay? And this question is now for you. So tell me why, why w we see this. Why... Um, foreign investment take place or FDI take place? Um, because we asked the same question when we talked about foreign aid. Uh, but again, these are two different uh, uh, sources of uh, uh, capital flows. So let me just know your, your thoughts about it. Wha what are the motives of FDI? They say there are three types of, um, of uh, uh, FDI. So of course, they, they uh, do this classification based on the motive behind the investment, of course, from the investing firm perspective. So market seeking FDI, resource seeking FDI, and efficiency seeking FDI. So 
the first type, the marking, the market seeking FDI, uh, is usually the type of FDI that is called horizontal FDI, and that happen horizontal FDI happen uh, when an investor or a, a, a company um, invests in the same business abroad, so the same business as um, it operates domestically, so they they do the same stuff abroad. So they aim to extend the market, so they want uh, a bigger market, and that's why they go and invest abroad. That's why investors decide to um, to uh, go abroad, and these are kind of um, tariff jumpers. So they try to avoid high tariffs, okay? And obviously, what are the determinants in this case, or what attract this source of, of, of capital flows or this, so this type of FDI, obviously is the market size. So they are more likely to uh, go and invest in bigger countries or countries with uh, uh, much larger uh, 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 market size and also that grow faster. Um, and also, if they, they're likely to go to or invest in countries with high tariffs, so they want to jump those tariffs by investing inside this country, so they don't have to pay these tariffs, and also when transport costs are very high. So these are the main determinants, okay? This is probably what attracts this sort of FDI. So if you compare this to the resource-seeking FDI, okay, so the market-seeking FDI, we're basically just looking for a market. They want to extend their markets, and that's why they go abroad. But resource-seeking uh, invest, uh, investors or resource-seeking FDI, they, these are investors who are interested in accessing or exploiting natural resources or, or resources that in general are not available in the home country. So these could be um, oil or could be uh, natural gas or could be even uh, cheap raw material and uh, uh, low cost labor, so cheap labor. And this sort of uh, FDI is usually export oriented, so they want to uh, minimize the cost, so they want to um, try to take the advantage of cheap inputs and, and then they can, uh, when they export this, uh, uh, what they produce, uh, then uh, they will have some sort of, uh, of advantage. Then from this, we could say then what attracts this sort of FDI, obviously, is the availability of these uh, uh, natural endowments or, or uh, the cheap inputs. Okay, so this is the sort of uh, determinants or factors that will attract this source uh, or this type of FDI. So compared to market-seeking uh, uh, FDI, market-seeking FDI, they just want to expand their uh, market, their market, and that's why they they invest abroad. So they look at the market size, look at the uh, uh, growth rate, for example, in the host economy. They look at the tariffs, the transportation costs, etc. So this sort of factors that would attract. Uh, FDI, uh, market seeking FDI. But with resource seeking, obviously number one is resources. So we look at cheap, cheaper, cheap um, inputs or natural resources in, in most cases, natural resources, oil and natural gas. So when you compare this with efficiency seeking uh, FDI, uh, basically they look for uh, factors that will enable them to compete in international markets. So they are not only export oriented but also they could be key or this sort of FDI could be key uh, to diversify exports so it's more difficult to attract compared to um, other the, the other two because this one if you have the resource endowment obviously the uh, this is what they after this one the market seeking they it depends on the market size but with efficiency seeking um, is probably more difficult to attract but it can be more than um, than a source of capital. It can provide productive jobs, expertise, technology, etc. We'll talk about this in general about how if there is important for these uh, uh, factors. Anyway, so these are the three de determinants or the three motives that based on which we can actually understand the determinants of FDI. 
And this is the, the second point I want to cover uh, today. And I think I will stop at this point to have a break. But before the break, just three, 30 seconds, the key messages so far, do you remember them? If that is the largest source, okay, of uh, financial, of, of foreign uh, uh, or capital flows. And the second message was how uh, this is distributed unevenly among for, uh, developing countries and even uh, among all countries. So the share of Africa is very, very small. Share of Sub-Saharan Africa, MENA countries, is very, very small. And then we ask it the question, what attract or what determine these uh, capital flows, FDI flows? Then we just use one paper. We looked at these different motives. We classified the FDI based on their motives to um, market seeking FDI, um, resource seeking FDI, and efficiency seeking FDI. And based on that, we could understand what factors or what determines these flows. Okay? So let's have a 10 minute break. And then next uh, part, we will talk uh, about the effect of FDI. Okay? So let's have a 10-minute break, and then I'll see you in 10 minutes. Any question before you go? OK, we'll have a break. <laughs> Thank you. We had two messages in the, fir in the first part of the lecture. One. If the I is important, is, is a large uh, source of uh, capital flows. It's the largest one. And the distribution of this, or the location of this FDI, how it moves, um, it's not an, um, it is uneven, so it's not, we don't know, um, like it's important to understand the, the motives and the determinants, and that's why we talked about different uh, motives of FDI. We, um, put this in three categories, uh, market seeking FDI, uh, resource seeking FDI, and efficiency seeking FDI. So now it comes to the point that we want to see, okay, so we, we, we talked about the trends, the distribution, how, um, uh, what, what are the motives behind or what determines FDI uh, flows. Now it comes to the, the question that concerns us. That, that, that's the, the important question to us, whether um, or do FDI influence, enhance or support economic development and growth? Yes or no, and why? There's always debates around these, uh, <coughs> these issues. So it's the case here, the same case here. D uh, FDI brings so, mu so much, uh, many arguments with and against. So um, many would propose or think that FDI is good for development and uh, growth. Others would say, well, it's not really uh, the case. So the usual stuff that comes with capital flows, which we already referred to when we discussed the role of uh, foreign, uh, foreign aid, um, FDI is important source. Um, that can fill resource gaps. So there are several resource gaps that FDI can help to, um, to fill. So the first one is saving gap, which we already discussed last lecture. We, we explained that economic growth requires investment and investments need savings, okay? And we already covered this in the first semester um, one of the very basic models of growth, Harrod and Domer models show that there's direct relationship between net savings and uh, ratio and output growth. So we understand that savings are important for growth. But if we don't have uh, savings, important for investment and also important for growth. So if, if we don't have enough saving to uh, cover these investments, then we have a gap, investment uh, saving gap. Then FDI can help to fill this gap. So this is the first gap. So as I said, there are several gaps, and uh, FDI can help to fill these, uh, these gaps. So trade gap, again, this is something we, we talked about with foreign aid because it's just the same, uh, the same intuition, the same logic, that this is the 
this capital flow or this source of uh, capital flow can actually help filling those sort of gaps. So trade gap or the uh, foreign exchange uh, uh, gap, again, it, it comes from the fact or it arises from the fact that most of these countries uh, suffer from um, uh, current account deficits. And then that means if the eye can, if the eye flows can help to fill this, uh, this sort of gap because they come with uh, foreign exchange for with uh, um, uh, resources or capital flows. So it can help actually to, to um, even over time it can, if it generate net positive flows of, of export. So if this FDI of this foreign, uh, for investment generate net uh, flow of export, uh, maybe in the, in the future over time, it actually might remove this deficit, might tend to be surplus. Um, the revenue gap, so when we talk about the revenue, we're talking about tax revenue or the um, public, uh, the government revenues. So obviously, um, when these investments operate uh, uh, in, a, in a foreign country, so the, the, the host uh, uh, country government obviously uh, collect taxes. So that means it, this can be used to support or to finance um, uh, development projects in those, in those countries. So it can fill the revenue gap, the tax revenue gap. Again, we talk about several gaps that FDI can fill. One of the really important gap that FDI can fill, which does not. So with these gaps, with the first two gaps, the trade gap and the savings gap, this can be filled by remittances, can be filled by uh, uh, foreign uh, aid, uh, but, but management gap, it's, it's something very specific, very uh, related to FDI, because they come and basically they become, like they have some presence in the country, they invest inside the country, they bring with them experts, they bring with them uh, new management uh, uh, like experience, uh, uh, different like technological skills that maybe does not exist in, in the host country. And hopefully, this sort of uh, set of skills and new technology will spill over. So we'll have some positive impacts in the, in, in, in the uh, 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 local economy or the uh, uh, domestic firms. So they usually come with also with equipment or, 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 or modern technology that is not available uh, in, those, in those countries. And as I said, this sort of knowledge or technology hopefully will leak out and will have some sort of spillover in, uh, in the economy. So these are the, uh, as I said, these are the, the argument with FGI. It's really, it's something good for growth, it's good for development, it fills um, many gaps, okay? Saving gap, trade gap or foreign exchange gap, revenue gap, the tax revenue here, and the management gap, okay? So there's also a counter, ga uh, counter arguments, okay? So some of these arguments say, well, actually, if the I, it may lead to uh, lower, have lower uh, savings and investment rates. How, how does this happen? Because if they raise capital locally, so if a foreign investor came to uh, a developing country and then they borrow money from, from, these, from their banks, from the domestic banks, then they didn't bring really capital with them, okay? So they compete with other investors on those resources. So some of them raise their money, their capital locally from, from those economies, and that, that way they crowd out investment of local firms because they compete with local investors on these resources, okay? So that's one way, so on, uh, and that how this is how lower investment rate because they crowd out or they drive out local investors because they compete with them uh, on these resources. Some, sometimes it could be because of the, uh, the uh, stifle competition or they, because of the agreement, the usually these companies, they are massive companies, they are very powerful, they can have um, the benefit from 
uh, uh, exclusive production agreements signed with the host uh, country government and again that will lower investment okay that will crowd out local investors the same thing uh, it might not help uh, local firms to uh, expand and grow again because they import their inputs so if they buy their inputs from local firms actually they pulling these firms with them they helping these firms to grow but if though it was the case that they buy or import all the or most of their imports from abroad okay uh, then or intermediate goods from abroad then they, it's not really helping uh, domestic firms um, the idea about filling the gap uh, related to the, the, the foreign exchange rate, the foreign exchange gap, um, it might happen initially, yes, but in the long term, if they import most of their intermediate products and capital goods, that actually might worsen the, 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 the case here. Okay, it might, it not, might not be that the impact that we actually can, we, 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 we would imagine. And also, most of them, they send the profits abroad, so they actually not reinvest. They don't reinvest their profits. So if they make profits, or when they make profits, they do make profits, lots of profits. So it depends on whether they're going to reinvest these profits in expanding the project in the host economy. That means there will be more uh, benefits to the host economy, or will they just uh, send most of this money back to the home country? Uh, the public revenue, again, uh, or the tax, uh, uh, the, the revenue gap, um, it doesn't seem, uh, some uh, the counter argument refers to the uh, tax concessions and the allowances that they receive, but more importantly, I think it's the transfer pricing. Transfer pricing, this is like a trick which is very common uh, between foreign investors or, or FDI. Uh, what they do, it's an accounting procedure that aim to lower tax, uh, uh, total tax paid. So if there's a transaction that happened between uh, the, the country, uh, sorry, the, the, the firm, and it's, let's say, it's uh, um, headquarter, for example, so they can put this on paper on any prices. So they, they increase the price, okay, so that they, the profit will seem to be very, very, uh, uh, very low. Or they can do this between different like affiliate companies in different places depending on the tax rate so basically they try to use these transfer pricing to reduce on paper of course these like just some accounts reduce the profit in, w in in host countries that have higher relatively higher tax rate and they move this to be seen more in countries with lower tax rate and that's what they mean by ta tax havens okay so, etc. So it could be um, again they could push the the, 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 the the host country to raise tariff to protect them, etc. So it might not be the case that they actually um, increase or fill the gap, the, the 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 revenue gap, the management gap. Again, there's a counter argument. Just remember, we're just trying to highlight counter arguments to the what the, what they said uh, initially. Uh, in terms of the benefits or what can FDI bring or how can FDI support uh, development. So now we're talking about the counter arguments. So regarding the management gap, the in terms of the entrepreneurial skills or technology that they bring, uh, well, they say it might have a little impact. It's actually less one than what we expect uh, because they usually they dominate the market. When they come, they dominate local markets and that is, they, they, they prevent other, um, they, 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 they don't allow other uh, firms to, to grow, and the, this sort of transfer or spillover might not take, uh, uh, take place. Um, more fundamental objections. So the objections that I mentioned so far are just counter arguments to what I mentioned earlier about how FDI benefits uh, development. But there are more objections uh, related to FDI, one of which is the sort of um, the form of dualistic structure that it creates. Um, it, it basically uh, promotes the interest of small number of workers who are well paid, so they work on those foreign companies, compared to the majority who are not, 
and this sort of inequality or dualism that create two two different sections in, in, in the economy. And also said that it diverts resources away from uh, uh, what we need to produce, ma mo in most cases food or basic uh, uh, products, to some more products that are relevant or are needed or demanded only by elites. Okay. Um, some compare between uh, the imbalance between rural and urban areas which already exists, the sort of imbalance exists, so FDI worsen it by locating itself mostly in urban areas. So it make the, the, the difference or the gap between rural and uh, between urban and rural area uh, uh, be, be becomes uh, 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 wider. Inappropriate patterns, again we just carry on with these sort of objections. Um, we, we already mentioned that, that it, it produced uh, products that uh, demanded by rich minority, not um, not the majority, but one of the important things here is the inappropriate consumption patterns. There's some sort of peer effect on those countries. People like maybe they um, you 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 wouldn't be surprised to see someone who um, very poor, but then uh, at the same time has the the I, I saw this myself has the um, the latest uh, iPhone, like something ridiculous, ridiculously expensive. Okay, this is the sort of inappropriate consumption pattern. Okay, so people can sell assets just to buy something very uh, luxuries that they don't really need. Why? Because of this, because they have, they are very good at advertising and marketing and they have some sort of market power that allow them to do this in, in foreign countries and in, in doing so they actually stimulate this sort of inappropriate consumption pattern okay so in a poor country in a, in a poor region you wouldn't imagine I saw this in the street having like really see poor people really having phones that may be worth like three four times more than my phone so I feel like you do you really need it Okay, but they do. This is the sort of, uh, they do buy it. So uh, this, this is the sort of inappropriate consumption pattern that it, it promotes. Obvi also, inappropriate technologies. Most of these countries, they have high unemployment rate. So when you import technology that is capital intensive, that save labor, this is not suitable for these countries. Okay, they need to create more jobs. You need to get people. These people get jobs for these people. So if FDI, yes, they want to uh, uh, import or use most advanced technology, but this technology might not be appropriate for this context. They they have high employment rates. Okay, so again, this is again a more objections about FDI. It might uh, invest in undesirable uh, projects, socially undesirable uh, products uh, or projects. And uh, again, we, we already talked about the imbalances between rural and, and, and urban area. Yeah, the rest to the bottom, this, this means how government, because as you see, some governments were, or some countries were successful at attracting more FDI compared to others. C governments or countries compete to attract FDI. So they try to give them allowances they try to give they try to be more attractive so they could offer them uh, investment allowance uh, cheap uh, provision of factor si factory uh, sites etc or, or or social services and this is a cost yeah this comes with cost so sometimes it might turns out that the net social return is negative if you compare the allowances how much they um they they can uh, seize from uh, or extract from those uh, governments, they are more powerful. If you look at their budget, most most of these over these ac their their their, um, their accounts, you'd see that some of these companies or, or multinational uh, corporation, they actually worth more than much more than the GDP of uh, a few countries. Okay, so it's like these are giants. You're talking about giants here. So when when they when they sit at a, a, a table to negotiate terms, then they are more powerful. They have more 
power compared to uh, poor countries or uh, developing countries. Uh, we already talked about crowding out, so I'm not going to talk about this again. It's again uh, the idea of uh, not giving, um, not supporting uh, 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 or competing with uh, uh, local um, investors and push them out of, of the market because they are more, much more powerful compared to these small uh, um, um, firms. Um, I think this one is more serious, more serious one because these, um, as I said, these multinational corporations are very powerful. They can gain control over local assets and jobs, so they can have some sort of influence over the government. Okay? So that means they will have influence over the decision-making process on those countries. And this could happen in many ways. Well, you, you could actually just pay corrupt leaders and then you get what you want, you take what you want, you push um, the uh, uh, policies, the, the way, the direction that you want, that's more favorable to you, it's not to the country, and it's very easy to be done. It is really easy to do this in, in, in corrupt countries, in, in poor countries. Or you can pay contribution to friendly political parties. Okay, so if you can't buy the government, you can buy the opposition or other parties, so you can buy someone there, okay, that has some, some sort of influence. But at the end, this can ruin the whole political process in, in the host nation, okay? And again, this is, this is very, like, fundamental uh, objection about FDI. So this is the, again, so what we said now, so these are the, yes, uh, as I said, this is an argument you will have people with and against, uh, with mainly oh, those who think that FDI is beneficial or important for um, uh, development base their argument mainly on filling resource gaps. Okay? On the other side, there are so many criticisms here. Um, there are counter-arguments to each one of uh, the ones that we, we raised about uh, or we discussed about filling the gaps and also there's even more fundamental objections about FDI. So what, what we're gonna, what I'm gonna finish with, which we just need to there now, is when we look at empirical evidence. Okay, I'm just gonna look at two papers very briefly, and and that's all. So the one paper, uh, 1980, 1998, uh, it looked at the FDI, the effect of FDI on economic growth. So the used data and FDI flows in 69 countries, developing countries, over two decades. And what they found is that FDI is important in, uh, for transferring technology um, and it contributes to uh, relatively more to growth compared to domestic investment. However, the important thing here is that higher productivity of FDI happen only when the host country has a threshold stock of human capital. So human capital is important, okay, for FDI to be uh, supportive to economic growth and development. Um, so this is, this is one, one paper. So it seems like, well, yes, uh, FDI seems to be okay. It's good for growth. Um, just remember when we talk about this, um, this sort of evidence, remember, always remember that there's difference between development and growth. So growth doesn't mean development, okay? Um, so it's something we, we discussed many times, and it's really, really important for anyone who studied development economics to understand that there's a big difference between development and growth. Growth isn't bad, but it's not enough in itself. So it's not, it doesn't mean development. Development is most much, much broader than uh, just growing. So I'm just gonna finish off with my paper. Um, this paper, as I said, we, we I tried to say, I, I said in the beginning, or maybe I referred to this, that tensions, political risks, conflicts, all these uh, factors, political factors, might turn uh, uh, FDI away from, from those countries. So unstable countries. So FDI requires stability. 
okay so some like stable environment to work in so if there's if there's conflict tension etc so it's less likely to be able to attract fdi we examined the fdi response to polit political shocks and what we did here we had the data set of 146 countries over uh, this period 1989 to 2015 and we wanted to exploit the uh, what happened in the arab region the arab uprising well we used to call it Arab Spring. We're not sure today if it is spring or, or, or winter. Um, uh, I had a paper just came out uh, uh, a few weeks ago. It's uh, Arab countries between winter and spring. So if you if you're really interested in institutions and and so you can read it. So it's uh, about the same thing. Uh, but anyway, so just going back to this point is. Um, call it spring or winter it doesn't matter but there was something there so there's like political shock there so the conclusion the main conclusion we found is that if there's improvement the positive shock here means improvement in institutions in a country that means this country will be able to attract more FDI okay so the main conclusion is yes good uh, institutional uh, uh, settings in a country will bring more uh, uh, FDI on the other side, what happened, which the main reason of this paper or the main uh, uh, motivation of this paper, what happened in that area dropped. Remember, MENA countries already had uh, uh, already has the low level of FDI anyway, so it's not very attractive to FDI anyway. But just imagine after what happened. Obviously, what you you didn't need this paper to tell you that. So to tell you that FDI will drop because there's uh, civil wars and, and, and tension or conflict there. But what we did is just we tried to quantify the effect. We tried to measure it. So this paper, exactly, that is, that is the contribution that sp this paper provides. So it's not here in the conclusion, but it is in the paper. So we tried to quantify exactly how much the drop was. Okay? But it's something that you would expect. Uh, maybe the paper just help you to tell you by how much, what happened exactly. Okay? But obviously... Um, this Arab Spring or this sort of instability led to a drop in FDI to this region, Middle East and uh, North Africa region. So the main conclusion is political institutions are very important. Stability is very important for uh, FDI. The previous paper obviously talked about what conditions that are important. Human capital is important for FDI to be supportive to economic growth. Okay? So, yes. In, in, in total, yes. Say, yeah. Yeah. If, if you see arms and weapons <laughs> you see that there's there's some countries who support both sides by the way so <laughs> pay to both sides anyway so this was as i said that was it so that was the last part so as i said all what we said now in the second half of the lecture is uh we talked about what is the effect of fdi so we start with the debate with or against first whether fdi um uh, affect growth or benefit growth and development or not so the first side was one side say yes and they mainly build their argument based on filling the resource gap on the other side they have so many objections they have so many counter arguments and then we uh, finish here by looking at uh, two empirical paper one of the first one just look in in, in very general uh, uh, sense that how if the eye affect growth it seems it seems like it has some positive effect but then there are some condition about human capital etc uh, in our paper we looked at whether this sort of instability how this or political qualities in in a country how this uh, help or in attracting FDI it does in general and in in particular when we look at the Arab Spring of course this instability there dropped the FDI flows to to this area so what next now we finish this this block we already next time the revision so please please don't miss the revision lecture and um, next time I'll I'll talk about this was as I said uh, just replacing what I, I wouldn't really be excited to teach I'm uh, putting something I would be more excited to teach so geopolitical risks conflicts and tension and how this affect development in general uh, I've done some research on this I'll be um, happy to share some of the results with you um any questions are you happy with this does this sound it does, does it sound okay to you okay okay so that's that's great so please as usual please before you go fill in the survey and thank you for coming today feel free to go after you finish the survey please please don't go without uh, filling the survey thank you so much see you next week